you'll have completeness of life, right? Even remember, well, some of you guys are too young, but back in the day, remember there were, there were bull, uh, not bulletin boards, but uh, billboards, and it had the Marlboro Man on them. Remember, he died of cancer, literally, but the, they had the Marlboro Man on them. And, and what is he doing? He's like sitting on a horse, and he's all ruggedly handsome, much like myself, and he's there, and he's got like a cigarette, right? And you look behind him, and it's just, a, it's just this incredible, like, landscape and cows and whatever. And, and, and what, is, what are they trying to portray? If you smoke these cigarettes, you will experience a fullness of life. If you drink Corona, you'll experience a fullness of life. If you watch this film, you'll experience a fullness of life. If you take, you know, all, this, all of our advertisements are all designed to target and, and bring us to a place where we think that will give me vitality, satisfaction, completeness. And Paul is saying, no, it's only found one place. And it's, it's, it's through eternity. And, it's, and, and not just, we can find life in this life too, but it will be completed in eternity. So then from there he says, verse 5, he says, Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. This is fascinating because Paul says, Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God. Now how does that work? And I don't claim to know entirely how it works, but, but if we go back to Adam and Eve again, the in the garden, right, you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then you have the tree of life. And God says you cannot eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of no the knowledge of good and evil, it, it seems like, a, I don't know about you, it took me years to kind of figure out like what that even meant. It just seems weird, doesn't it? You're like, wouldn't it be like the bad fruit tree? Like what's the, but it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the idea, and what Satan, I think, uh, in a sense, in his, in his endeavor to deceive exposes a little bit about what it is. Because he says, when you, Satan says, when you eat that, you will be able to decide good and evil for yourself, right? You will be like God. That was, that's, the, that's the thing. And that, it, that's exactly what you see in our society, right? Subjective truth. This is good, this is evil. And so we have this crazy society and the globe that's going on right now because everybody's deciding for themselves what is good and what is evil. We don't have, or I should say the world doesn't have ultimate firm truth. They have subjective truth, and that's, that's where it gets us. So when we're looking here at what Paul's uh, uh, talking about, when it, it's kind of wild because he says that he fashioned us for this purpose. God fashioned us for the purpose to have mortal bodies. But we didn't get the, the full effect of mortal body until after sin. Because when, when and it's interesting too, because when Eve ate this, this fruit, when, it's, when she desired to be able to dictate for herself good and evil, it doesn't say that death entered the world through Eve. It says that death entered the world through Adam. So Eve partakes deceived, she passes to Adam, and the implication is that Adam rebelled. That Eve ate out of deception, Adam ate out of rebellion. Seeing his wife do this, he takes the fruit, he eats it, and now death comes flying into humanity. And I don't know what that would have been like. I think it would have been wild, though. All of a sudden, you go from being innocent, you go from not having really a knowledge of sin or thinking in a sinful way or dealing with those kind of thoughts to instantaneously before you, you and your wife begin to corrupt. Everything around you begins to corrupt. The world is instantly cursed, and God comes looking for you and says, where are you, Adam? And all this event that it took place. And so people begin to die. People begin to uh, uh, have pain, all the things that come along with that. So somehow, in God's incredible wisdom, knowing that human beings would choose sin, they would choose to rebel against him, they would choose to try to establish their own good and evil for themselves, He's made, I don't know how it worked, but in the fall, God is still able to use these fallen bodies and has fashioned our souls to be part of them in order that this portion of life, this portion of pre-eternity, if you will, or perhaps you might think of it as a, a bubble of time in the midst of eternity, that we live it out and it has a purpose for us. 
Because we can have a lot of thoughts like, well, why does God have it this way? I don't know if you've ever given God suggestions, but it seems like a popular thing to do. And we say, well, it should have been this way. It should have been that way. Well, you, you shouldn't have us be on earth. Why don't we get saved and just immediately shoot up into heaven? Why, did, you know, why, why do we have to tell the gospel? Why doesn't Jesus just fly around and tell the gospel? You know, all the myriad of things that we could come up with. Why? I think it's this. Number one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it represented something besides trying to choose your own destiny. It represented choice, right? Because God is not interested in robots. He didn't create yes people, right? He didn't create people that, just, that were slaves. Jesus even says, I don't call you slaves. I call you friends. You know how you have a friend? They choose to be with you. That's real friendship. If you had a relationship, if, if you came to my house for dinner and you saw my wife with like an ankle chain to the, to the table, right? And then I, when you came in, I'm like, oh, it's so glad to see you. This is my wife, Tam. She's really great. Man, she loves me so much. She never leaves. That would be invalid, wouldn't it? If she never had a choice to leave, I could never know that she truly loved me. The, 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 the reality that, they, that she could leave at any time, at any day, and do whatever she wants in this world, but she chooses to stay, it shows something, doesn't it? She's crazy. <laughs> no. That she loves me, right? She loves our home. She loves our children. So here's the thing. God creates this choice for humanity. And he says, I know what's good for you. I know what's best for you. We walk in the garden. We hang out. I created botany for you, right? But he says, he says, you have choice. Don't take it, but you have it if you want it. And it's no surprise that when we chose against what God had for us, that we died. Spiritually, that, that everything that was good went away except for him. And all of a sudden, this new thing has to become, and there's centuries, and then, and then Abraham shows up, and all that kind of thing. And so today, what is this life about? It's about choice. It's about choosing to walk with Jesus to experience his goodness in this mortality, in this fallen body, in this life. And the more that we choose Christ, the more that we get to experience eternal life on this side. It sounds scary sometimes. It sounds like it wouldn't actually be eternal life sometimes. Sometimes inside of our hearts with our sinful nature, everything inside of us rages and says, no, no, this cannot be. When Christ invites us along and says, no, you'll find life here. Whether it's Peter walking on the water, whether it's when Jesus tells Peter, <laughs> it's one of my favorite scenes. When he's talking to John and then, and then Peter says, well, what about me? And he says, well, if I tell John, if I cause John to be alive until I come back, what is that to you, Peter? And by the way, you're going to be crucified. And you're like, oh, womp, womp, womp. You know, like, that's not what I'm trying to hear today. But he just this, 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 whole, this, this whole dynamic that even in suffering, even in, with Peter knowing the way he would die, and he was with his wife. And, and the, the recorded last words of Peter are, woman, be strong, as he's crucified upside down to his wife. You know, the fellowship there, the, not woman like woman. I mean, it's, it's a different, it's the, the word Jesus uses. It's like a, a term of affection. It doesn't really translate <laughs> into our society. But he says, woman, be strong. So you, you have this, this opportunity for you and I in a fallen, mortal, temporal, transitory state to experience the goodness and the eternality of God in this very life. But we get to choose it, don't we? We get to choose whether we have that life or we don't. First, we get to choose that if we're going to be saved or not, and then we get to choose it as Christians, are we going to let God work in our hearts? Because he's always working, he's always moving, he's always inviting. And it's really up to us if we're going to accept it or not. Are we going to receive that? Or are we going to keep eating from the same tree and wondering why it keeps hurting us? Why we feel isolated? Why we feel anxious and depressed and lonely when we can be in the midst of a bunch of people that care about us? Continually we choose our own destiny, or we try to, and continually we're left empty. It's the human experience. It's radical. And here's Jesus saying, Make the choice.